Hey, hi, hello, welcome to my channel. I am so happy to have you here. Carrie Woolley, age 38, lived in a home in Wesley Heights on Warwick Road in Olton, Salahiel. Salahiel is located on the outskirts of the city of Birmingham in West Midlands, United Kingdom. Carrie was a pretty, petite blonde with bright blue eyes. And in early 2020, she had returned to dating after a divorce from the father of her two children. Carrie struggled a bit with alcohol, but her family was supportive and always thought of her as a beautiful soul with a warm personality. In early 2020, Carrie met a man named Ian Bennett, and they started to go on the occasional date. For a few weeks, it seemed to be going well. They had only been dating for about six weeks before something went terribly wrong. This is the story of Ian Bennett. Ian Bennett, also age 38, lived with his parents in Salahiel, and he couldn't believe his luck when he started dating Carrie. She was beautiful, friendly, and she liked to have a good time. But when Ian rang 999, the UK's emergency phone number, on the morning of July 12, 2020, during the height of the pandemic lockdown, and reported a crime, a horrible crime, his luck had definitely run out. What he told the police was that he had come to his girlfriend's flat after trying to reach her all morning and getting no answer and had been able to enter the home through the unlocked front door. What he had found inside could have been the result of a robbery. He was unsure, he told the police, but he was sure of what happened to Carrie. He had found Carrie Woolley dead in her bedroom. Ian told the police that Carrie had devastating injuries to her neck. It was a bloody and disturbing crime scene in Carrie's home. The police body cam footage was recording when Ian relayed all the events of that morning and the previous night to the police. A UK expert forensic video analyst explains, contrary to common belief, officer body-worn cameras are always recording, but it's not until the point where the officer presses the start button that the recording then becomes a video file, which can then be retrieved later. Experts explain further that body cam footage can turn into crucial evidence in any case. The camera has a wide angle, so it is recording people going in and out of a crime scene, possible witnesses, or possible evidence at the scene. And on July 12, 2020, it was recording Ian Bennett giving what he thought was a convincing explanation of the last time he had seen Carrie alive. The footage was recorded as he stood outside of Carrie's apartment building, smoking a cigarette and looking tearful and upset, or at least trying to look tearful and upset. Ian gave the officer an uninvited and detailed explanation of his whereabouts the previous evening. At face value, it seemed plausible, but an analyst would later describe Ian's actions as something one would say or do as to not appear suspicious. Ian was oversharing with the officer, and he was avoiding eye contact. He explains the following. I'm sorry, sir. What was the last time you saw? One o'clock, I left her this morning. Here. Yeah, we was having a few drinks. He told the police that he had left Carrie at her flat on the previous evening, July 11th, 2020, at around 1 a.m. He said that his mother and father had had a big argument at home, so he had went home to make sure everything was okay. Um, my mum and dad had a big argument at home, so I went home last night to make sure everything was all right there. He goes on to say, I'm trying to read them a text all day, no answers. And the door, the doors wasn't open, I had to pull the handle. Yeah. Ian points toward the door and sobs, it's horrific. On the police body cam footage, Ian is seen crying, or pretending to cry. He seems distraught. He is shaky and he's smoking that cigarette. Looking back at that video after knowing the details of the case, it seems like a performance. At the time, however, it would have been more difficult for the police to spot it as acting. Ian's performance for the police continued with a phone call he made on his cell phone to his mother. Ian is seen calling his mother and relaying the news of Carrie's death in a very upset tone. 
and the police body cam records that interaction that Ian has with his mother on the phone. He tells his mother, named Linda Bennett, over the phone that he had found Carrie dead in her home. But Ian doesn't refer to Carrie by her name, only saying, Mom, she's dead. And he says that the police and the ambulance were there. <laughs> A video analyst later described Ian as seeming pretty calm and not too traumatized. Even though no weapons were found at the scene and they had no direct evidence against Ian at the time, since Ian was admittedly the last person to see Carrie alive, the police quickly arrest Ian on suspicion of murder. The time of day was 4.40 p.m. on July 12, 2020, when Ian Bennett was put in the back of the police car. I'm being arrested for murder at this time, okay? Did you not murder? A suspicion at the moment, okay? Based on obviously what's happened here. He looked surprised by the arrest, but not overly shocked, and he did not protest the matter. The police body cam recording continued when Ian's mother, Linda, arrived on the scene. When Linda arrived outside of Carrie's flat, she was eerily calm when being faced with the fact that her son had been arrested on suspicion of murdering his girlfriend. Linda simply asks the police why her son was being arrested and where he would be taken. The officer says, possibly Coventry. And Linda replies, Coventry? Hmm, I don't know how to get to Coventry. So the moment we'll be going to custody. Uh, I don't know which custody, I'll let you know. It's possibly going to be Coventry, hopefully. Coventry, yeah. That's the closest one we've got. No, I have to get to Coventry. Linda did not ask about what happened to Carrie. She seemed to only be concerned about what was happening to her son. Ian Bennett was taken into custody while the forensic team got to work. The digital forensic examination started with pulling data from both Ian and Carrie's cell phones. Police pulled messages from both Ian and Carrie's phones and discovered that the pair had only met several weeks before Carrie's death. From the phone records, it was obvious that there was already tension between the two. What the police discovered from their phones was that the couple had been arguing only a couple days before Carrie's death. Ian's messages included a text to one of Carrie's friends, accusing that person of sleeping with Carrie. It seemed as if Ian thought that they were in a more serious relationship that Carrie may have thought. It may have been that Ian wanted to control and manage his partner's behavior, and Carrie wasn't down for that. When it comes to a crime of passion, it doesn't matter that the relationship may not be as real to the victim as it is to the perpetrator. If the relationship is real in the perpetrator's mind, it exists. The messages that Ian sent to Carrie proved that he was very angry with her and had accused her of cheating on him. In those texts, Ian had accused Carrie of messaging a former partner. It was later revealed by police that this accusation was unfounded. Additional forensic investigation revealed that Ian had recently made a disturbing search on the internet. He had typed in the phrase, best way to get revenge on a woman. Mobile phone data showed that both Ian and Carrie's phones went silent at about 11.30 p.m. on July 11th. That was unusual for Carrie because she often was on the phone into the late hours of the evening and early hours of the morning. Ian's phone became active once again at about 4 a.m. when he attempted to call Carrie and then kept on trying to call and message her throughout the morning. Testimony in court would later reveal that Ian and Carrie had gone out for a drink and had a conversation with another couple at a wine bar. Afterward, Ian had accused Carrie of cheating on him with the woman from that couple, and Ian would not let it go. He began to send offensive messages to Carrie and threatening messages to the woman from the couple they had just met. The police knew from what their cell phones revealed that Ian Bennett was their prime suspect in Carrie's murder, and the autopsy of Carrie Woolley revealed horrifying findings. Carrie had first been strangled and then smothered. 
She was left with broken ribs and broken bones in her neck. She also suffered over 50 wounds made with a knife, including 30 stab wounds to her neck and upper torso. Most of the damage was done to her neck. Two knives were used, one with a serrated blade and the other with a smooth blade. The violence of the murder was extreme. It was believed that Carrie would have been conscious during some of her attack, and the investigators noted the evidence of defensive injuries. Carrie had fought back against her attacker. The investigators turned to the cameras in the neighborhood area of Carrie's apartment building. They needed that additional information to see when actually Ian had arrived and then left Carrie's flat. CCTV footage from a camera of Carrie's street showed Ian leaving Carrie's flat late in the night, carrying a bag. Ian looked calm, striding across the street, looking as if he had not a care in the world. And it was clear to the investigators that the man in the CCTV footage was indeed Ian Bennett, based on the build, the height, the weight, and facial features. A second camera which captured CCTV footage also shows Ian walking into a nearby park carrying that same bag. Not only carrying the bag, but casually swinging it before disappearing off camera for about two minutes of time. When he is seen again on camera walking out of the park, he does not have that bag with him. A later search through that same park found that discarded bag. Inside were blood-stained pants and oven gloves. Those items would eventually be analyzed and those stains were a match for Carrie's DNA. And that bag was not the only thing that Ian Bennett had discarded that night. Investigators searching CCTV footage also found video of a car stopped on a local bridge and the image of Ian Bennett walking away from the car towards the bridge throwing something over into the water and then returning to that car. He threw a bundle over the side and a later search of the water in that canal revealed the bundle. It contained at least one of the two knives that were used in the attack on Carrie Woolley. They had found a large knife with a bent blade. The DNA on that knife matched Carrie's DNA and it also matched someone else's. The license of the car on the bridge had been positively identified by the system of police cameras in the area. That system of police cameras also has the ability to track the movements of identified vehicles throughout the country. The license identified the owner of the car, and the owner was Linda Bennett. Linda Bennett, Ian's mother. Ian had been driven to the canal bridge in the middle of the night by his mommy, Linda. DNA on the knife retrieved from the water later matched both Carrie and Linda Bennett. Linda Bennett, age 63, was now also a suspect as an accessory in the murder of Carrie Woolley. But in what exact way had she been involved? Based on the identification of Linda's car on the bridge, the police impounded her vehicle, and during their investigation of the car's contents, they found stunning evidence, and it completely changed the course of the investigation. It wasn't necessarily physical material evidence, it was more digital evidence. Linda's car had a dash cam, and that camera had recorded all the events of that evening, the night Carrie was killed and footage from that dash cam clearly showed Ian Bennett tossing that bundle containing the weapon used in Carrie's murder over the railing at the bridge into the water below. And that dash cam footage showed more. The recorded video from Linda Bennett's vehicle showed that her car left the address of the home, which was shared by herself, her husband, and her son Ian in Salahul, and take a 40-minute drive around the Salahul borough past shops on Prospect Lane. And this was only shortly after the time in which police believed that Ian Bennett had killed Carrie. The dash cam footage showed all the traveling and the stops Linda's car had made that night. It was clear to police that Linda was involved in the cleanup of the murder of Carrie, the murder she was helping to clean up for her son. 
To be certain that it was indeed Linda who was in the vehicle that night driving around, investigators retrieved the cell phone data of Linda Bennett's phone. And that data showed that Linda Bennett's phone was in the same area in which the car traveled that evening. Linda Bennett was arrested as a result. Both Ian Bennett and Linda Bennett both pled not guilty to their charges and their trial commenced in December of 2021. Ian Bennett did not give evidence during the trial, but he had claimed to police that during an argument, Carrie had been aggressive and had had a knife. He said that afterwards he had no memory of what had happened because he had blacked out. Trial evidence showed that Ian had gone to Carrie's flat on the evening of July 11th and confronted her, accusing her of cheating on him. At some point, he had thrown Carrie's phone into her TV. Then he had proceeded to advance on Carrie with a knife. Ian Bennett strangled Carrie, smothered her, and ultimately inflicted over 50 wounds with a knife into her body. Ian Bennett was found guilty by Burnham Crown Court. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 25 years. The jury took only two hours to reach their verdict. The detective who worked the case said this, Ian Bennett had acted in a paranoid, obsessive, and controlling way. Then he had unleashed a vicious and brutal attack on Carrie, a woman he'd been in a relationship with for only a few weeks. He then chose to blatantly lie about what he had done and also hide evidence even though we discovered dash cam footage, the knife, and the clothes. The judge who presided over the trial said this, Ian carried out a calm and calculated effort to avoid justice by removing weapons and other items from the scene of the crime, and then later staging a robbery at Carrie's flat. To Ian, the judge said this, Carrie had only been going out with you for a number of weeks before you murdered her. You had gone out for a drink and fell into conversation with another couple at a wine bar. Later, you accused Carrie of cheating with the other lady. Having returned, you began to send offensive messages to Carrie and threatening messages to the other lady you had just met. During the night, you looked on the internet to find out how to get revenge on a woman. The judge continued, the following night, you went to Carrie's flat. You left the flat two and a half hours later. You savagely murdered her in a number of ways. These included strangling her, smothering her, leaving her with broken ribs and broken bones in her neck. You then inflicted over 50 wounds with a knife, including 30 stab wounds to her neck and surrounding area. The violence was extreme. Further, the judge said, you were confident in your deception, and when you were arrested, you even joked with police in the car, as you believed that your plan would succeed. The judge added that an experienced pathologist considered Carrie's murder to be one of the most horrific murders he had ever seen. Linda Bennett denied assisting her son after Carrie's homicide and perverting the course of justice for which she was charged. Linda told the jury that she was not aware of her son dumping items used in a murder or that he had harmed Carrie. Linda was also found guilty and convicted, and she received a three-year prison sentence. The judge told Linda, you, Linda Bennett, made determined efforts to assist your son. The actions you took had a profound effect on the administration of justice. It was a mere good fortune that your car had CCTV, which revealed what you had done. Later, the judge also said, Linda had misguided but genuine love for her son when she did what she did. But after the fullness of time, she had no remorse for having done it. Neither mother nor son have publicly shown any remorse for what they did to Carrie Woolley. One might be able to make the argument that the controlling and manipulating behavior that Ian Bennett showed toward Carrie 
may have also been used with his own mother, Linda. Perhaps he controlled and manipulated her as well. Perhaps he even bullied her or threatened her into coming to help him clean up his crime. Or one might argue, on the other hand, perhaps Linda was the person who taught and passed on those bad qualities to her son, and that she didn't have to be convinced to help her son clean up in the aftermath of murder. Any pleading of innocence or lack of knowledge of the crime by both Ian and his mom, Linda, was emphatically refuted by the digital evidence gathered from street cameras, dash cam footage, body cam footage, and cell phones. Their lies and any script they had devised between the two of them was irrefutably put down as false. Linda's car dash cam footage clearly showed that she was involved in the aftermath of the murder in terms of helping him to dispose of the weapon and other evidence. Carrie Woolley's mom, Lynn, made an impact statement to the court in which she read, No parent should ever have to live with the image of their own child lying in a mortuary. Speaking of her daughter, she said, She was bubbly, she had a heart of gold, and she had everything to live for. Her death has left a massive hole in our lives. Carrie's family and friends went on to say that it was unbearable to think that Carrie's children would have to grow up in a world without her. Carrie's children, who at the time of the trial were aged 10 and 14, wrote a statement which was read out at court. In it, they said, although she is no longer with us, she will always be with us in spirit. They said that family events such as gatherings and holidays would never be the same, and all those opportunities to say, I love you, were now gone. The children said their mom always made them laugh and that they always knew they were loved. They added, Mother's Day this year was the first time we did not send or make a card. It was a very difficult day for us to get through, but you left us beautiful memories. The children continued saying, Your love is still our guide. Although we can't see you, we know you will always be by our side. Rest in peace, Carrie Woolley. Thank you for your time and watching this video. I know that your time is valuable and I appreciate that you spent some of it listening to this case with me. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. I always like to hear what you have to say. If you would like to watch more true crime cases from me, check out my playlist. And I know you know, it's rough out there, so please take care. I'll be thinking of you, and I will see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.